This video will discuss the sequencing of jobs on two machines using Johnson's rule. In this example problem, we have the first machine or work center, and the times to complete five jobs at that work center are estimated to be 5, 3, 8, 10, and 7. Once the jobs are completed, on machine one or work center one, they have to go to work center two. The estimated completion times for these jobs in that work center are two, six, four, seven, and twelve. The first thing that we need to do is create a formula that will look up the, the times based on the sequence of the jobs. We'll simply put a sequence in the model to start with that is a first come first serve sequence. The ones in the yellow grid are interpreted as follows. Job A is scheduled in the first position. Job B is scheduled in the second position. Job three is scheduled, C is scheduled in the third position. Job D is scheduled in the fourth position. And job E is scheduled in the fifth position. The numbers at the top of the columns represent the position of the jobs in the sequence that they'll be performed. The rows in the grid represent each job. If the row totals at the right all equal 1, and the column totals at the bottom all equal 1, this is a valid sequence because each job has been assigned once, and each position in the sequence is taken. We'll build the model with this first come first serve sequence in place. The formulas that we will put in this section basically represent lookup formulas to find the time associated with each position in the sequence. We'll use a sum product formula for column B with absolute references on the column and row, and column D with absolute references only on the row. This will allow the formula that references column D to be copied to the right. We do the same thing for time number two, which is the time on the second machine and workstation. The sum product of the values in column C with absolute references on the column and row, and column D with absolute references on the row only. I'm using the F4 or function 4 key and pressing it multiple times to get the different options for absolute references until I arrive at the ones on the row. Because there are no absolute references on column D, this formula can be copied to the right. The times in the time one row now are the times for the jobs in the sequence they appear in the grid for machine one. The times in the time two row are the times for the jobs in the sequence they appear in the grid on machine two. On rows 14 and 15, we're going to measure the start time on machine 1 and the finish time on machine 1 for each job. The start time on machine 1 for the first job in the sequence is always 0. The finish time on machine 1 
is the start time on machine 1 plus the machine 1 processing time. For the second job and beyond, the start time on machine 1 can be equal to the time the previous job finishes on that machine. So if the first job in the sequence finishes machine 1 at 5, the second job in the sequence on machine 2 can start at 5. And then the finish time is the start time plus the processing time. Once we complete the formulas for the second job of the sequence, these can be copied to the right. Rows 17 and 18 represent the start time and finish time on machine 2 for each job. For the first job in the sequence, that job can start on machine 2 when it finishes on machine 1. That job will finish on machine 2 at its start time plus its machine 2 processing time. Starting at job 2 in the sequence, this formula needs to use some logic. Job 2 in the sequence can start on the second machine at the larger of two times. It can start when it's finished on machine 1, but that must be greater than when it, the previous job finishes on machine 2. If this job is finished on machine 1, but we're still waiting for the last job in the sequence to finish on machine 2, this will push out the starting time for job 2 in the sequence. The finish time is then the start time plus the machine 2 processing time. we fill in the rest of the time, start and finish times for machine 2, the same way. Once the model is constructed like this, we can use Johnson's rule to establish a sequence. Here we have all the jobs listed, as well as their times. Johnson's rule says we choose the job with the shortest activity time. The shortest activity time is two periods, and that occurs on machine two. If the shortest time is on machine two, and that is in the second work center or second machine, we schedule that job last in the sequence. So we would put that job in position five. Once a job is scheduled, it's eliminated from the list. Now we take the remaining jobs. We can gray out A because it no longer needs to be scheduled. The shortest time remaining is the three-period time for job B on machine one. Since that is a machine one time, that means we'll place that job first in the first available position in the sequence. So now job B is scheduled. Now we look at the remaining jobs. Four periods is the shortest completion time and that's on machine two. So we're going to put this job as close to the end of the sequence as we can, which is the fourth position.
The remaining jobs are DNA. The shortest completion time on any machine is 7, but it occurs both for machine 1 and 2. In this case, we can simply take the machine one time and use that to place the jobs in the sequence. If we do that, since it's machine one time, we place it as close to the beginning of the sequence as possible in the second position, which leaves one job to be scheduled. That's D in the third position. And that's Johnson's rule. What we see here is a sequence of B, E, D, C, and A, and a finish time of 35 periods. The objective is to minimize this finish time. So we walk through Johnson's rule to gain this sequence. It's also possible to use solver to suggest a, a, a sequence. The use solver will start with ones in all of the yellow cells. We want to minimize the finish time for the second job on the last machine. The changing cells are the assignments of the jobs to the workstations in this sequence. There are two sets of constraints. Each job must be assigned exactly once. Each place in the sequence must be assigned exactly once. We use an integer constraint as well to force the entries in the grid to be either 0 or 1. A binary constraint would do the same thing because an integer constraint or a binary constraint will do the same thing because of the sum constraints that the numbers are either going to be 0 or 1. So we click solve. We see that Solver finds the same sequence as it found earlier. B, E, D, C, and A. Notice the problem is difficult for Solver to determine. It took quite a while and a lot of iterations with Solver to find the solution. We could potentially help Solver by setting, say, one of the jobs in the sequence. If we find the shortest activity time of A, and we know that can be the last one in the sequence, we can set all the other cells to ones, and then run salt. Solver still has to go through a number of iterations, but it does find the same solution in a little bit less time. Remember, we can use Solver, but we can also just go through the steps of Johnson's rule to establish the sequence, and this model will still help calculate the start and finish times for each job on each machine.